Good afternoon and welcome to our uh, open Sunday school class. Uh, pray that you're having an incredible Sunday. And today we'd like to um, begin our lesson today with a word of prayer. If you would bow with us. Father in heaven, most gracious God. Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, how worthy is your name in all of the earth. Father, we thank you for these moments that you allow us to gather, Father, that we might reason together, study your word, Father, not for knowledge's sake, Father, but so that we might be edified and that you may be glorified. Father, we thank you for the words on these pages, and we ask you that you would uh, allow us to live these words out in applicable form in our lives so that men and women would be able to recognize us as followers of Christ. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're in John chapter 17. Our lesson today is called for the world's belief. Uh, we'll begin reading at verse 14. So that's John chapter 17, starting at verse 14. And the Bible reads, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou should keepeth them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through the truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through thy word. That they all may be one, and thou, Father, are in me, as the Father are in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Finally, I in them, and thou in me that thou may be made perfect in one, and that the world would know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me as thou hast loved me. Thank God to the reading, the hearing, and most of all, the doing of his holy word. We have an interesting and very challenging text on today. Uh, John 17 is the close uh, of the final discourse. Uh, Jesus is speaking to them on that Thursday night. Uh, they are having the Lord's Supper. They've had the Lord's Supper, actually. Uh, he's washed their feet. And this is the quote-unquote farewell address. And what is interesting about Jesus giving a farewell address is that a farewell address for him is a prayer for others. Uh, Jesus finds himself in an intercessory way praying for those whom he will be leaving behind. One of the things that should be a trait of ours as well is that those people who have fought, that will be following us, uh, those people that we have taught, uh, those people we see as sons and daughters, even more than, uh, even as we see our own sons and daughters, uh, those who have uh, followed us as we have followed the Lord, uh, and we just are, are so overwhelmed sometimes in praying for them that, that we go to a different place. And that's kind of where Jesus is in chapter 17. He, he's emptied himself. He's no longer concerned with self. Uh, he recognizes that on tomorrow, Friday, um, this is Thursday night, on Friday he will be crucified. He recognizes he'll be going away from uh, these men who he dearly loves. And in and, and, and leaving these men who he dearly loves, he wants to prepare them 
for the world's belief. So he is praying to God that God would be with them during his absence uh, and that they would be able to have the power through the Holy Spirit to bring a world, an unbelieving world, to belief in God. And, and so he's praying for the disciples. Uh, he's praying then for uh, future believers. You know, I, I don't know if it ever dawns on us, really, uh, that, that people came before us, prayed for us. It is now our responsibility to pray for those who come behind us as future believers, as future leaders in the church, as future pastors and teachers. Uh, we, we should be praying that, uh, that they would follow the teaching of the Lord, mainly, and, and that they would be a force in a, in a world that they don't belong to. And that's what this is really all about. So let's begin to look at uh, verse uh, 14. Verse 14 says, I have given them thy word. Now, he's been with them for three years. He says, I've given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Well, one of the things you need to recognize, first and foremost, You've got to live in a world that you're not of. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Uh, we don't believe in the world's belief system. Uh, we don't understand the world like unbelievers understand the world. We don't live by the standard that they live by. Uh, and, and so he's saying, I've given them your word. And what does the word do? The word strengthens us. So, so he says, I've strengthened them with your word. Because they're going to need strength because the people that they're going to meet are going to hate them. And, you know, hate is such a strong word. But, 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 but unbelievers, uh, those who don't think we're silly because we believe in a God whom we cannot see, uh, believe that are hostile to us uh, because of our belief. You know, some, some people just look at us and laugh at us. But some people don't like us because simply we believe in the word of God. Uh, they're hostile to us. Uh, and and, and it, you know, that's what persecution looks like. Persecution looks like people who are hostile to you for no apparent reason. People who don't know you, people who don't interact with you, do not like you simply because you're labeled a child of God. And that's their reasoning for hating you. So, so Jesus is praying to God to prepare these men for the kind of persecution that they'll go through as a, as a uh, uh, attempt to show the world that Jesus is Lord uh, and that he is the only way to salvation. So he knows that there's going to be roadblocks. So he's not just saying this to the Father. He's saying this for their sake. He wants them to recognize, first of all, they don't want him to go. They want to be completely dependent on, on him for all things. But, but just like any child, even any earthly child, we train them uh, in the word of God, and then we leave them. And, and what happens is we know the training that we gave them, no matter how long it takes them to garner it in their heart, that they will garner it in their hearts. We train up a child in the way he should go. And we know that at some point in his life, he'll go back to it. So, so an earthly father would teach his earthly son because he knows he's going to leave him. But he's going to give him instructions. He's going to pray for him. And this is where we are here. This is Jesus Christ loving these 11 and, and, and coming to the realization that it is over, that, that tonight is the last night. You have to recognize in the, in the, in the context of where we are, uh, these are the final words said to these men before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He, he realizes that in moments, moments after his prayer, he's going to be captured in the garden 
taken through all the trials, and then crucified on the next day. So, so it's imperative in his mind that he ask God to empower them and to strengthen them for the days ahead. You know, um, it's an incredible thing that the might of Jesus, in his, in his incredible might, he is humble enough to bow to a holy God in an interceptual way for these 11 disciples. Verse 15 says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou should keepeth them from evil. You know, it's, it's interesting. God is not, Jesus is not asking God to take them out. He's asking them to build a hedge of protection around them. You know, one of the things I say when I pray uh, is God build a hedge of protection around me so that no hurt, harm, or danger would come to me. Uh, and, and, and I say that for my children as well because what, what I want is I recognize we got to live in a hostile world, a world that has its own structure, a world that has its own belief, and they don't match up with that of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're living in a hostile world. People are hostile toward you. He said, don't take them out of the world. Just protect them while they're in the world. Uh, that's, 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 that's the crux of what he's asking them to do, it, it is allow them to be distinct in the world. You know, distinct is an interesting word. Uh, distinct can mean special. Uh, it can mean peculiar, actually. And the Bible says we're supposed to be peculiar people. And part of being peculiar is looking odd in the world. If we look just like they look, and if we act just like they act, then we aren't doing the job that God has called us to do by witnessing to a dying world. You witness to a dying world not just with your words, but with your behaviors, how you act in the workplace how you act in the grocery store, how you interact with people, period. That's how people know that you are a disciple of God, that you love one another. That was clearly uh, part of, uh, of Jesus' teaching to the disciples. That's how they'll recognize you is because you'll be different. So, so while they're different and while he knows that they're going to be living in a world that hates them, he wants them to be equipped, but he also wants them to be prepared. Uh, and, and that's kind of what that looks like for uh, us. When we're out in the world, we know that it's a hostile world. We know they don't like us. But it is our mission to love them. You know, you don't just love those who love you. That's simple, to love people who love you. The Bible says love your enemies, those people who persecute you, right? Those, those are the ones that the Bible says you should even love is those who persecute you. Right. And now we're looking at verse 16. He says they are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. Is not that interesting? Uh, they are not of this world. Well, what happens is Christians either do one or two things. They typically withdraw from everything that has to do with secular life. Or they enmesh themselves in everything that has to do with secular life. And what I mean is some people shy away from sinners. Some people get too close to sinners. You know, it's clear that one of the reasons that the priests and the scribes hated Jesus was they said he eats with sinners and publicans. They believed that he got too close to them. And one of the things that Jesus has shown us as an example is that we can never become too holy to help people who need our help in the world. Now, he's, he, he's not chummy with them, but he helped people who didn't even believe in him. He cured people who didn't even believe in him because we are called, it is our mission to live in this dying world, but not be of it. Not, 
get so close to it that you might get burned, but not shy away from it that you're no good, you're no earthly good. See, some of us are so holy that we aren't any earthly good. Well, well what happens is people uh, who don't know the Lord are attracted to people who are not afraid of them. And, and so many Christians see non-Christian uh, as a threat, and, and, and they just back up. They, you know, uh, my son says this thing. He says, give me, six, get, get, give me 50 feet. Well, he said that way before COVID. He, he means I need my space. I, I don't want to be near you. I don't want you. Really, he's not saying I don't want to be near you. He's saying I don't want you near me. Well, unfortunately, that is not the way that Christ teaches us. He teaches us to embrace people who are sinners and publicans. Living in a fashion that would change them. Not them living in a fashion that would change us. That's the difference. Some of us live so close, so close to the edge that the things that the patterns of this world have rubbed off on us and even some of our churches. And he's saying for us to be examples to a dying world. We're not living in it. Uh, We're living in it, but we're not of it. And so as we get to verse 17, he says, sanctify them through the truth, thy word is the truth. You know, this thing of sanctification is an interesting concept that most people don't really uh, recognize. Uh, they, they don't understand that, that sanctification means to be set apart for God's service. Uh, the Bible says, be ye separate. And, and what that means is it doesn't mean that you can't be around sinners. It just means that your walk is clearly different from sinners because you seek to be closer to the Lord. Also, you seek uh, those things which are important to God. Those things that are important to God are the things that are important to you. And as we mature in our spiritual lives, you know, we, we continue to take steps higher and higher and higher in our sanctification, uh, we recognize that our mission is the world. That's why this lesson is called uh, our mission to the world. You know, we are called to the world's belief. That's what it is. We are supposed to be uh, vessels of light uh, who walk in a dark world as a ray of hope for people who know not Jesus Christ. That, that's what, you know, we, our aim, our, our aim should be every day, as, as the Bible says, renewing ourselves day by day, every day becoming a better Christian, every day being more Christ-like, trying to get to, the Bible says, I am holy, be ye holy, for I am holy. You know, we want to sanctify ourselves because we want to look like what God wants us to look like. We should want to look like what God wants us to look like. And what, he, what he's saying here in, the, in this verse is that he wants to make sure that they are sanctified, not just for sanctification's sake, but for truth's sake. You know, it's interesting, you know, uh, Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? And, and that's what the world will ask you. The truth is the word of God. Uh, when you emaciate yourself, w- w- when, you, when you indulge yourself, uh, uh, w- when you consume yourself with the word of God, what happens then is you become not only a better Christian, but, but you, you become a person that non-Christians can look at, appreciate, and even go to. You know that um, Nicodemus snuck away. Uh, you know, he didn't want anybody to know um, that he wanted to talk to Jesus, so he snuck away. Uh, and the interesting thing is, is that's what will happen to you uh, in the world. When you're peculiar in the world, When people clearly recognize that you are sanctified, that you are set apart, uh, they gravitate to you 
like a magnet. And, and that's how you know that uh, you you're, you're, have accepted your call to world belief and that you're in this world, you're not of it, but you're making a difference while you're here. And, and that's part of what being a Christian is about. It's, it's not, it's not to, to grab a hold to salvation and, and, and just hold it for ourselves and not share it. So here we want to sanctify ourselves, but not for the sake of ourselves, for the sake of those God has called us to believe. Verse 18 says, And thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. This is really interesting because what you're looking at is um, basically a, a mission, orders given. Um, God sent Jesus into the world, and, and he did that for a purpose, so that we could be saved. Jesus sent these 11 into the world so that people could be saved. You know, it's the same mission. Uh, we are not just saved to be separated. We are saved to have a testimony and to help others and uh, actually unfold the, the gospel to those who don't believe. Uh, that, that's really our mission here. And that's what Jesus is praying for. He, this is called the high priestly prayer. And, and this high priestly prayer says, allow these men to make a difference in the world. And, you know, I would hope that all of us as Christians, part of our spiritual goal is to make a difference in the world. You know, I, every day when I wake up, you know, I, I want to ask, I want to thank God for allowing me to wake up. But then secondly, I want to ask him, what it, can I do today to make a difference in the world? Because I'm called to the world's belief. And you're called to the world's belief. If you're a Christian, you're called to the world's belief. And you should be asking God, what is it I can do today to glorify your Father? So now, he says, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself. That they may also be sanctified through the truth. You know, he didn't need to have a higher calling, obviously. Uh, he was already sanctified, but he says what it is, is this is for them. You know, many of the times when Jesus is doing miracles, the Bible says he did it so that his disciples could see. It was for their benefit. So many of the things he does or did were, was for someone else's benefit. And, and here he's praying for this group of men that they would be holy and unblemished in a tarnished world. And he wants them to go forth with power and unction. He wants them to recognize that God has sent them into the world. Or he has sent them into the world to be light, to, to, to save people from an everlasting hell, to say that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and one of the things that is so important uh, is that God has sent us into the world, too. He, he didn't just send those 11. Those are just the first 11. Now we're part of that same group. Uh, all of us, God has a different plan and purpose for our lives. So we don't all have the exact same mission. But part of our general mission is that we are supposed to be lights in a dark world so that the world would know that Jesus lives. I want to read you a um, quote from William Barclay. Uh, William Barclay is a noted uh, theologian. He's known all over the world, all over the globe. And he says this. Christianity was never meant to withdraw a man from life. It was meant to equip him better for life. If you have that, please put that on the screen. Christianity does not 
offer us release from problems. It offers us a way to solve our problems. Christianity, Christianity does not offer us an easy peace. It offers us a triumphant warfare. Christianity does not offer us a life in which troubles are escaped or evaded. It offers us a life in which troubles are faced and conquered. The Christian may, must never desire to abandon the world. He must always desire to win the world. That, 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 that's what William Barclay said. He said, you know, we don't want to withdraw from the world. What we want to do is we want to win the world. And that's because we're called for the world's belief. Let's now look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, Neither pray I for these alone. It's going to get interesting here. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. All right, here we go. So now this gospel is about to multiply. I call this evangelism by multiplication. And what I mean by evangelism by multiplication is this. Is if I tell two people about the Lord Jesus Christ and they believe. Those two people then tell four people, then my net is, not, is no longer two. It's the two I did, the eight they did, equaling ten. So it's, it's by multiplication. So my two turned into ten because I just witnessed the two people. Each of them witnessed the four people each, right? Uh, uh, each, each has four in their net giving you eight plus the initial two gives you 10. And what has to happen is the multiplication process just keeps going because you, the one turns into obviously the two that you witness to. Those two do two more and those two do four more and those four do six more. And you just continue to multiply because what happens is God has called us to his mission, which is going therefore and making disciples of all men. And, and, and here Jesus says, what I'm praying for is not just for these 11, but for the ones that these 11 will impact. And, and that's where it is for us. Jesus is not just praying for us as Sunday school teachers. He's praying for those that we would impact. And then he's praying for those that they would impact. And then he's praying for those who they would impact. And, and on down the line, because he sent us, he's called us for the world's belief. And he's equipping us and he's praying for us that God would build a hedge of protection around us, that we would be bold in our proclamation, that we would go forth into a dying world, preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ so that men's lives could be saved. You know, there's a truth that there's an everlasting damnation. And what we're trying to do is save men from that destiny. Because we're all called. So, the, you know, the thing is, it, 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 some of us are really local in our thinking. So local that we can only think about people who live in our houses. Um, but the Bible says that he wants, in Acts 1, 8, he wants us to be his witnesses. Uh, he, he says first he wants us to be his witnesses in Jerusalem. That's right there at home. Then he says he wants us to be his witnesses in all of Judea, which would be the region, the area, the neighborhood, all of those for us. Then he says he wants us to be witnesses in Samaria. Those are the, you know, the Jews and the, and, and, the Gent and the Samaritans hated one another. That's why I said he's also calling us to love our enemies Enough that we could tell them that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Enough that they might be saved. So he wants us to be witnesses even in places that are uncomfortable to us. With people who we have an issue with. There's so many people we have issues with. But that does not preclude us from sharing the gospel with them. Then finally he says he wants us to go global. And, and, and that's what happens when, when you take this thing to a new level. And you go global. You know, when you go global with the gospel, 
you have really done something. What, what, what happens is, is, is you start out locally. You teach your children. You train them up in the way they should go. Right? And, and, and you pray that when they're old, they won't depart from it. Yeah, that's where you start. But once you go global, you, you have decided that everyone is worthy. That you could go to this third world country because you're called not for home witness, not for state witness, not for national witness, but it says for the world's mission. That, that's what this is all about. It's the world's mission. This is a global opportunity. You have the opportunity to help believers all over the globe, people who would never get the gospel, people who would never be told the truth, people who live in places where Christianity is illegal. Those are the people that God wants us to reach out to and pray for as he is praying. I am not praying for these 11 alone. I'm praying for those who they will con in contact with as he is praying for us. We all, have, we all have wayward children. We all have a sibling or so who, who has fallen off the track. We all know friends who, who are not saved. Uh, there, there's not a one of us that can say we don't know a person who is unsaved. Some of us sleep next to people who are unsaved. So we know at least one person who was unsaved. And it's our responsibility to be lights in this dark world and live a life that's pleasing in God's sight. Uh, you know, one of the things that it says over in 1 Corinthians in chapter 7, it, it, it says for women who have married an unsaved man, uh, for them to allow their Christian character to be their witness to their husband. And, and that's what uh, we have to even look at that in a deeper way. You know, uh, as saved people, we have to allow our Christian conduct to, to, to show people, not just tell people, but to show people that God is in our hearts. We love him. He loves us. And that we love them most of all. And that we want to see them saved. And so Jesus is praying right now that all believers, current believers, future believers, that, that they'll have that kind of power, that they'll resonate uh, in communities, that they'll resonate in countries, that they'll resonate internationally because it is his desire that none should perish. So, so he's given us this mission, and we've got to now accept this mission as, and, and, and obviously, this is a scary thing. These 11 men were afraid out of their minds. The last thing they wanted was for Jesus to, live, to leave them. Uh, Peter went bitterly. He, didn't, he, he, he never believed that Jesus would leave. And Jesus repeatedly, remember this is what we call a farewell address, the high priestly prayer. He's attempting to get them to recognize he's about to leave. And he's giving them their instructions. That's what you do in a farewell address. You give people their instructions for how you want them to live, what you want them to do. And then you pray for them as mightily as Jesus is praying for this 11 and all that they will come in contact with. Then he says in verse 21 that they all be warned. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So what he's saying, in, in essence, is the unity of the believers is how the unbelievers recognize that Jesus is in us. How we treat each other how we love each other, how we interact with each other, how we respect each other. That's how the unbeliever sees that Jesus is in our heart. You know, you know 
everybody knows how to talk to talk. But not everybody knows how to walk to walk. And what Jesus is saying here, that this is how they will recognize you as a child of God. This is how they will recognize you. It's the unity of the believers. You know, one of the things I've always liked about this church, um, so, so, so many times you, you find churches where the leadership don't get along. And, and there's always friction in the leadership. And, and sometimes there are many voices in the leadership. One of the consistent things you have known and seen from this, uh, uh, this pulpit, from, from, from this church, is that we have one voice here at the Mount Olive Baptist Church, and that's the voice of our pastor. We follow him as he follows Christ. And we can do that because we trust that he's following Christ. So we're not divided. We're unified. All of us are unified together behind a common goal, a common mission, should we say. And that mission is the world's belief. We do this on a local level, but we know that we're reaching out. One of the beautiful things about how God is dealing with us right now in this time is that all of our Sunday school classes are on Zoom. They're all being live streamed. And anybody globally, anywhere, has access to them. So God has now, in a time where we can't even meet together and shake each other's hands and hug one another and talk uh, within a six feet radius of one another, we can now evangelize the world because God has given us this ability. And we should not take it lightly. And part of that is being unified. Um, and it's not just looking like you're unified. It's actually being unified, being in one body. And, and, and thank God, I thank God every day for this church and for this pastor. Because, because it doesn't have to be like it is. Uh, we don't, he doesn't have to love us. Our pastor, he doesn't. He doesn't have to share with us. He doesn't have to allow us to preach, but he does because we're unified. And we support him as uh, God is leading him. Because that's what God has called us to do, to be a body of unified believers. Nobody's going to believe multiple voices. But, but, but clearly in this church, there's one voice. We listen to Jesus Christ he tells our pastor, our pastor tells us, and we are unified. We rally around what our Lord and Savior has given our pastor, and we move forward as a unit. We don't move forward individually. Now, we all have our own individual gifts, but we move as the pastor moves. And we always got to remember that. We move as the pastor moves because we're a unified body. Okay, now he says in verse 22, And the glory which thou givest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So what has to happen is what I just said. You know, these men, Peter and Andrew and Nathaniel and Philip, and all of these, James, all, 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 John, this whole group, they've got to be unified under one heading, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There, there can be no multiple messages. The disciples went out with the same message, all of them. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. No man goes before heaven except by him. That's the unified message that these men gave to a dying world. Verse 23 says, And I in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one. You know, this is interesting. And, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me as thou hast, as the, and, excuse me, sent me and hast loved them, excuse me, as thou hast loved me. The interesting thing here now is, is, is we're closing here. It, it's really all about connection. 
it, it really all boils down to connection. And, 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 and I'm connected to you, and you're connected to me. And I'm connected to the pastor, and the pastor's connected to me. And, 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 and it just keeps going on like that. Because what happens, he, said, he says that he is in Jesus. says, I am under the authority of Christ. And you are under the authority of me. I am the lover of the church. I am the keeper of the church. And, 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 and clearly, uh, that connection that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ is what continues to move us forth in a dying world. It's what gives us energy. It, it, it's what consumes us with the message that we must give to a dying world. We are called for the world's belief. I pray that you take that seriously on the day, that, that, that you believe that you're part of that group. Yeah, uh, we're all in this together. Uh, as God is in Jesus and as Jesus is in us and we are unified, we are called for the world's belief. And I pray that on this day you believe that you're called for the world's belief. God bless you and God keep you is my prayer.